Good morning. So glad you could join us today. My name is Keith. I'm one of those associates here, along with Pastor Eileen. There are two links below, one for attendance and the other one for the bulletin, if you want to follow along. Well, this is the first Sunday of Lent, and Pastor Neil is starting a new series, Teach Us to Pray, based on the Gospel of Luke. Today's passage, sermon is Receiving the Holy Spirit. I'm looking forward to that. Well, grab your Bible, let's worship the Lord together. to worship. Holy Spirit, rain down on us today. Let our souls drink your goodness and let our hearts overflow. Amen. We're all waiting expectantly and we're all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who's more powerful than I will come, the straps on his sandals, I am not worthy to unite. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. When all the people were baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Our hymn can be found in your e-bulletin, O Spirit of the Living God. We will sing verses 1 and 2. Will you join us? Yeah. 
so glad that you are with us. I'm one of the pastors and I'm thankful for uh, those who are sharing worship with us today. Uh, my colleagues uh, Keith Lee and Eileen Gilmer, Jason who's read the scripture for us, uh, Jerry and Catherine and the ensemble who provide the music. Uh, a lot of uh, time and effort goes into preparing our services and I'm thankful uh, for all those who are participating. We're kicking off really the season of Lent today uh, or the first Sunday in Lent and considering uh, what it means to learn to pray uh, from the teaching and example of Jesus. And I'm so glad that you're joining us. I want to invite you to uh, share this link, uh, this service, with friends and family. There might be others who have questions about what it is to pray and how we learn and grow in our prayer life. And this, I hope, will be a resource uh, not only for you, but for others. And so feel free. I want to encourage you, but feel free to share uh, this with others. So as we consider the meaning of the scripture for our lives, I want to invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. Eternal God, we are grateful that you call us together to be your people. We trust in your presence. We know that you bless us in ways that are beyond our comprehension. I pray that you will use the, the words of the scripture, the words that I share aloud, that you will guide them and direct them, that you will be present in our lives through the power of your spirit that we will grow closer to you and closer to one another during this holy season as we are your people, not only today, but always. Bless us, we pray, in the name of the living Christ. Amen. So this morning, uh, kicking off a series of sermons for the season of Lent called Teach Us to Pray. Uh, the premise of this series is that, that prayer is an essential spiritual discipline. I think uh, that most of us understand prayer's importance and why it is important, uh, but we may also come up uh, against stumbling blocks or, or experiences, uh, questions we have about prayer. And so we're going to take some time over the next few weeks to uh, see what we can learn about prayer. Uh, it is something we can learn. We learn by practice. We learn by study. Uh, we learn by reflection. Uh, one of the ways that you can continue to learn is take part in the Lent study that my wife is teaching. Uh, it'll be on Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. It's during the pastor's Bible study time. And so Anne's a great teacher. You're going to be blessed by the class. And uh, there was an announcement in the bulletin day about it. She'd love to have an email from you if you are planning uh, to participate. Uh, and so we learn to pray by watching and doing. And uh, many of us have learned to pray by watching our parents pray or hearing our parents pray. Many of us learn to pray by listening to pastors pray. And uh, that part of what we do when we worship together, when pastors pray or other leaders pray, uh, those are examples for us that we can uh, take into our own lives as we learn and grow in our discipleship. Uh, there are a number of books that have been written about prayer over the years. I did a quick search this week. Amazon, uh, Amazon the bookseller, uh, has more than 70,000 books uh, that come up when you just search for the word prayer. And according to uh, their algorithms, 500 of them uh, have been added in the past 30 days. So that just speaks to the importance of prayer in our lives, and our cultural lives, and the availability of information about prayer. If you simply Google the word prayer uh, in your search engine, uh, 772 million, 772 million hits or sites uh, come up. Now, I'm not recommending that you try to read all of them. Maybe not all of them will be helpful, but it just speaks to the importance of prayer in our lives. We 
We learn to pray uh, in many, many ways. And we learn to pray from the example of Jesus. Uh, what we discover is that he not only taught about prayer, he was a man of prayer. And when he prayed, uh, we discover there's a connection between uh, his life of prayer and his ministry. And we're going to explore that uh, over the course of this series. Uh, Jesus' disciples, uh, specifically in Luke's gospel, Jesus' disciples observed him praying listen to him praying, and in the 11th chapter, which we are going to get to a little bit later in the series, uh, they go to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray. And so some of his words are part of what we know as the Lord's Prayer, uh, but he has more to say. And Actually, we're going to uh, hear some of those words from Luke 11 uh, a little bit later this morning. So we're going to use Luke's Gospel, and I want to encourage you to have your Bible handy. Uh, you may want to read along when the scriptures are read in our worship and then have those passages available when uh, I'm sharing the message because I'm going to refer to them and you might uh, find it helpful to read along in some of these places. Uh, I also want to encourage you to read Luke's Gospel with us during Lent. I have prepared a Lent devotion that uh, will guide us through the entire Gospel. And uh, it actually started this past week, so if you haven't started it yet, you can find it on our website. Uh, you can get it by email. If you're not getting it, contact the church office and we'll make sure you're added to the list uh, to receive these uh, emails. It's a short devotion, just a few lines, some reflection questions, a couple uh, sentence, maybe a sentence or two of prayer uh, that will get you started in your own uh, devotional life. But we're going to read the gospel together. And if you receive the devotion by email, you might uh, want to check out that you can click the, the scripture link and it'll open up the scripture for you. Uh, so if you're uh, taking a break at work or you have your phone, you can find that link and, uh, and have the scripture available to you very easily. Luke's gospel is beautifully written. The original Greek, uh, Greek scholars tell us it's beautiful Greek. Uh, and what we discover is that Luke described Jesus as a man of prayer more than the other gospels combined. That, that, he, that many of the scenes that we are familiar with, we can find in Luke's gospel a reference to Jesus praying, uh, maybe more, not maybe, but more than the other gospel messages uh, combined. So we're going to look at Luke's gospel. I want to begin with the prologue. So if you have your Bible, turn to the beginning of Luke, Luke 1, uh, verses 1 through 4. Luke alone offers a prologue, Luke of the gospel writers. It describes his method. There had been other writings about Jesus. Other gospels had been written, and we believe that Luke had access to Mark's gospel. That seems pretty clear. Uh, so what Luke tells us is that he investigated all of this and decided to write another account. And what I, I want you to hear is that when Luke said he was going to write another account, it wasn't just about the history or the details of Jesus' life, that there were important meanings and messages that he felt like his readers, and he names Theophilus as his primary reader, his readers needed to hear. And one of them, we believe, is that Jesus prayed and that his disciples could learn to pray from his example and from his teaching. So Luke invites us to ask some questions. Here's some questions you might want to, to note as you're reading the gospel is, what are we supposed to pay attention to? What are we supposed to notice in uh, the, the words that we read? What are, why is what Luke's describing important in Jesus' life and ministry? Uh, words uh, were very carefully chosen. That it, writing, The writing process was not like opening a Word document and, and having a, you could flow all the words you want and edit and, and uh, copy and paste and cut. It didn't work like that. And so words were very carefully chosen. So why did, why did the gospel writer include this, this story? And what message do you want us to hear? What does it mean? What are we supposed to learn? What are we supposed to learn about God, about Jesus, about ourselves? And then maybe the most important question is, what are we supposed to do with this? And so I'm hoping that you're going to hear uh, answers to those questions as we read, gospel, read the gospel together and consider it in these sermons. So Luke's gospel begins with a prologue. And then in chapter 1, we meet uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who are John the Baptist's parents. We also uh, see, meet Mary and the interplay of uh, the preparation for the birth of John and the birth of Jesus are interwoven in the opening chapters of Luke's gospel. Chapter 2, uh, Jesus is born. Luke tells us about uh, the circumstances surrounding his birth and the shepherds in the fields who were keeping watch and seeing the angels and hearing the angels. Uh, Luke 2 also tells us about the 12-year-old Jesus in the temple, uh, the only kind of adolescent story in uh, the four gospels.
Uh, if you're reading uh, the devotional material, you might uh, have some reflection on that uh, as we learn and consider what that means for us. And then we get to chapter 3, and it's 18 years later. Uh, so that would be where uh, in the movie or the TV show they would say 18 years later we meet the adult Jesus, uh, and we introduce John, grown-up John, who's fulfilling prophecy and uh, baptizing all of the people and calling them to repent. And so what happens next is very important. And so we're, we've made it to Luke 3, uh, verses 21 and 22. And so if you have your Bible, you can read along, but listen to, to these words. Listen to how Luke describes the baptism of Jesus. He says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven came, saying, You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. So pay attention to what Luke is saying. Luke's emphasis, it's not on the baptism himself. It's not on the baptism itself. Everyone, even Jesus, had been baptized. That's, the baptisms are in past tense. They had been baptized. And the scene that Luke describes is what happens while Jesus was praying. What Luke describes is what happens while Jesus was praying. Three things happen. We'll pay attention to that. The heaven opened, <coughs> excuse me, the Holy Spirit descended, and then the heavenly voice of God spoke. Now, we're going to consider uh, next week um, what it means when we, <coughs> excuse me, to learn and to know more about who we are through prayer. And so that was one of the themes in the baptism. We're going to hold that thought and talk about it more next week. Um, and so the identification of Jesus as God's son is important, uh, but we're going to come back to that. But what we want to consider today is that prayer con connects Jesus' life and ministry with the Holy Spirit. That, that when Jesus prays, the Holy Spirit is at work in his life. And it's not that the, the Spirit is not at work all the time, but prayer is, a, is an avenue, a channel, a means for the Spirit to work in his life. Now, when we pray, we may not experience a dramatic scene like this. The heavens may not open, or we may not hear a heavenly voice. But I believe that when we pray, we make ourselves available to the power of God through God's Holy Spirit. So if one of, <coughs> excuse me, if one of our primary questions is, why should we pray? The beginning of the answer is that when we pray, God's Spirit has more full, uh, is more fully access to our lives. We are available to receive God's spirit, the spirit that God desires to give us. And then the continuation of that answer, we, the first part is that we've received the Holy Spirit. The second part is the Holy Spirit is a source of power for us. We want to have access to and connect to the greatest power in the universe, God's resurrection power, God's power that, that is kind of beyond our comprehension. See, I'm struck by the fact that power is is desire for power is part of our human existence. We, we want to make, at our best, we want to make a difference in the world, and we know that we need some form of power to do that. At our worst, we want to dominate others and get our own way, and we need power to do that as well. And so wanting power and, and needing power and wanting to make use of power is written into our DNA as part of who we are. And, and in many ways, we could describe our life journey as a, as a search for power. Money gives us power. Uh, education and knowledge is powerful. Uh, authority uh, it gives us power, our position, our status, uh, our sources of power. And we spend uh, a great deal of our time and energy uh, seeking that kind of power. It's not surprising that one of the temptations that Jesus faced was uh, about power and about whose power and how he would use power uh, in the world. We, too, face those temptations. But back to prayer. When we think about prayer, it is an access to us, if we are following the teaching and example of Jesus, to experience the Holy Spirit and have God's power at work in us. Uh, think about the fact that the, the Holy Spirit is, is the power of God at work. In, in chapter 1, Luke describes how Gabriel, the angel, tell, visits Mary and says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Again, from the very beginning, Luke connects the Holy Spirit and power. In chapter 4, when Jesus begins his ministry, Luke tells us, Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, 
return to Galilee. And then in chapter 24 of Luke, and then in Acts, Acts 1, and what we need to remember is that the book of Acts was written by Luke. The same writer who wrote the gospel wrote Acts. It, Acts is essentially volume 2 of Luke's account of, of what God was doing at, at work, how God was at work in the lives of the early church and the early believers. And so Acts 1 uh, says, Jesus says to the waiting disciples before he ascends into heaven, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You see, the, the connection is, is made clear for us. The Holy Spirit is a source of power, and when we pray, we open ourselves up to God's power working in our lives. So, if we want to experience the power of God, if we want to make a difference in the world, and friends, I, I think you do. I know I do. I, I know that the world is not what God wants it to be, and, and God has called me and you and us as a church and as a people to change the world, to make a difference in the world. Our, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And the only way we can do that is if God's power is at work in our lives. So if we want to be the people through whom God changes the world, we have to have power to get things done. Not our power, not human power, but God's power. And when we pray, we put ourselves in the position to receive that power. Now, one of the things that you might hear me say uh, uh, periodically is that I think that the gospel message needs to come with warning labels. And in fact, Jesus thought that too, because on more than one occasion, he warned his disciples about the cost of following him, the cost of that discipleship. It was a sense, beware. If you're going to take the next step, he says, beware of what might happen to you. It kind of like prayer can be like that too, and, and receiving the Spirit and God's power can be like a Pandora's box that if we open it up, we may not, we may not fully comprehend what we'll unleash in the world. Uh, so we need to be careful about what we're getting into and what we're asking for. And, and I, I think that over the course of history, there have been people that have peered into that, that Pandora's box of what God is going to do in our lives and said, I'm not sure I want that. And they closed the box back down. I hope that's not you. I hope that's not us. Robert Fulgham uh, wrote a number of books uh, a number of years ago now. Uh, the most famous was All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And in, in that, one of the, it's a, a series of essentially journal entries of his life. Uh, and, and they're humorous and they're meaningful. And one of them he tells about a time he was trying to help a nice couple, as he describes them, from Idaho who had a dead battery. And uh, so Fulgham says he had the jumper cables, uh, but it turned out that neither he nor the guy from Idaho really knew how to use them. And so they hooked them up the best way they thought, and then they fired up the car, turned the ignition, and this is what he says. He says, electrical arc, an electrical arc between the cars that not only fried his ignition system, it welded the jumper cables to my battery and knocked the baseball cap off his head. He said it sounded like the world's largest bug zapper. And then, and then he says, power is amazing thing. And he quotes the man from Idaho saying, ignorance and power and pride are a deadly mixture, you know. And I wonder if that's not a warning for us, that uh, if we are not careful with the power that God gives us, it can, well, it can knock us off our feet. And ignorance and power and pride can be a deadly mixture. So here's what we want to pay attention to, is that when we pray, we open ourselves up to God's spirit at work in our lives, that God's spirit is a source of God's power. Uh, and we need to be careful about that, because what we know is that when God has access to our lives, we may be asked or sent or led to do things that we may not want to do. One of the things that we discover is that the spirit leads us into places we may not go on our own. Things we may not want to do, situations we may not choose for ourselves. Uh, in Luke's gospel in chapter 4, when, when Jesus, this is after the baptism, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Where he's tempted and he's tested and his ministry is clarified and he wrestles with, he wrestles with who he is. In the midst of the evil force, the evil forces. And he was forced to and he came out of that stronger because he could choose God over the worldly power that, that he was tempted with. So the Holy Spirit may, may lead us into places like that where we have to wrestle with ourselves and with God. And friends, let me just offer that Lent is, an, in its own way, a wilderness experience. 
And that we're forced to consider our mortality. That's why we put ashes on our forehead on, on Ash Wednesday. We're forced to ask the question of, can we do this on our own or do we need God's grace? And we're forced to, to consider who we choose to follow and what kind of power we choose to let unleash in our lives and in the world. So we may be in a period of clarifying who we are as individuals, as a church, as a nation, as a world. And then once that's clear in us, the Holy Spirit may send us to share the good news with others. And for many of us, that's a scary prospect. When we, when we get to Acts, we, we read about how, how the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and then they were sent into the world to proclaim the good news to the four corners of the earth, right? To tell others about Jesus. And that's the power of the Spirit at work. And so just beware. God might lead us into places that we're not comfortable in or beyond our comfort zones. And the question for us every day is, do we, will we trust that God knows best? So when we learn to pray, when we actually pray, we discover that God opens, the, that our lives are open to the Spirit of God, and the, the Spirit of God is access to the power of God that will transform our lives and transform the world. And that we can share that good news. We're given the words we need, the ability we need, and if we ask, the courage we need to change the world. So here, go back to where we, well, where we picked up is that if you want to change the world, friends, and I believe you do, that we need to be people who pray. Because when we pray, we open our hearts and minds to God's Spirit. God's Spirit is at work in our lives, and we experience the power of God at work. So maybe you've been praying, maybe you haven't, maybe you're new to this. Again, I want to commend the Lent study that Anne is going to lead uh, uh, for more explanation, exploration and conversation about it. Uh, but if you haven't yet experienced the power that, God, that Luke describes, if, if you haven't experienced the Spirit in fresh and powerful ways and, and experienced the power of God flowing in and through you, then I, I want to offer you four things to check. Uh, this is a checklist. Uh, ch check These four things you can check on as... Uh, you kind of review and reflect on your life during the season of Lent. The first thing I want to say is, I think I may have said this a couple times before, is to check your language. And no, I don't mean to check whether you swear words or not, but check the language you use surrounding prayer. And many of us are guilty of this. I'm guilty of this too. We, we very easily talk about believing the power of prayer. And friends, I think that's the wrong language. Because when we talk about the power of prayer, we talk about our own power, what we're doing, and we give ourselves credit. We, we, that the power of prayer is at work in our lives because we pray. Well, I want to suggest to you what we really believe in is the power of God. It is access through prayer, and, and yes, we have a role in this, but ultimately it is the power of God. The prayer is a means for God to work in our lives, friends. So if, you, if you're not experiencing, if we're not experiencing uh, the power of the Spirit in our lives as fully as God desires, then let's check our language and make sure we're talking about God's power, not our own. The second thing is to check our motivation. Why are we praying and why do we want this power? Uh, power is seductive and, and we want it and we want a lot of it. Uh, and we want it, if we're really honest, for our own benefit and our own glory. Luke, in, in the 8th chapter of Acts, tells the story of a man named Simon from Samaria who, who sees what God is doing in the midst of the, of the people who are receiving the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and it's a, Luke tells us that Peter and John went and prayed uh, that these people could receive the Holy Spirit. And, and when Simon saw it, Simon said to, Luke and, uh, to uh, Peter and John, he offered them money and said, give me this power so that I can do this myself. And well... The power of God, the power of the Spirit is not something we can buy. And so he was rebuked by Peter, who says, your heart is not right before God. So when, if we're not experiencing God's power in the way that we believe God desires, we should check not only our language, but our motivation. Are we, are we seeking it for the right reasons? The third thing I would say is to check your connection. Uh, this uh, idea that the power of God is available to us, but our connection may be uh, not as strong as it could be, came home to me many, many years ago. This was pre-ministry. I was a, a civil engineer corps officer in the United States Navy. 
uh, right out of college. I have a civil engineering degree, and, uh, and part of my call story is that I didn't, at that point in my life, I didn't want any part of ministry. My dad had been a pastor, and I wanted to see the world and do other things. So uh, 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 engineering degree, uh, commission in the Navy, uh, civil engineer corps, uh, did have a chance to see uh, much of the world, and what a blessing that was. But uh, my uh, second and last duty station was with Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 7, uh, a CB battalion, if you're familiar with that. And uh, I was home ported out of Gulfport, Mississippi. And uh, uh, some of my uh, friends, uh, other officers, and I found a really nice apartment complex in Biloxi, uh, where when we were in home port, that's where we would stay. And, uh, and so we came back from a deployment, and uh, we had uh, arranged for these apartments and moved into an apartment and uh, called the power company and you know, made sure all the utilities were hooked up. And that first night, uh, my friends, their apartments, the power was up and running. Uh, but there wasn't any power in my apartment. And so uh, the power company had said it might take some time. And so I was frustrated and went down to the store and got some candles and still no power. My friends had power. I didn't have power. Uh, and just, uh, you know, by the time I was, I was tired and of all the moving and I got into bed, and somewhere, I think around 3 o'clock in the morning, I sat straight up in the bed. I think I said a non-church appropriate word and went to uh, the circuit breaker, which had been turned off. And when I flipped the switch, the lights came on. The power had been there all along. My connection was not good. I was blaming the power company for not making the connection. And yet, it was on my end that the connection was off. So I remember that when I think about not having that connection with God's power in my life. I know that it's not God. God's power is available. God's spirit is at work in, in my life and in the world if I will be willing to open the connection and flip the switch to allow God to work in my life. When I did realize that I needed to flip the switch, I had all the power that I needed. And so check your connection. Check your language. Check your motivation. Check your connection. And then check your prayers, friends. I said that in Luke 11, and we're going to get there a little bit more fully in the, in the next few weeks, but in Luke 11, Jesus' disciples who had seen him praying and seen the, the power of God at work in his life when he prayed, and so they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he, he offers them a few lines that make up the, kind of the heart of uh, our, our Lord's prayer, the, the Lord's prayer that we pray every week. But then he continued. And his answer included these words. Listen carefully. This is from Luke 11, beginning with verse 9. He says, I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Those are such comforting words that we can ask and God promises, right? But we have to pay attention. We have to read all the way to the end. He says, for everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds and everyone who knocks and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Again, good news. And then he makes a comparison, kind of like from lesser to greater, of a human to God. He says, if anyone among you who, is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if a child asks for an egg, will get a scorpion? Of course not. You know, good parents wouldn't do that. How much better is God, is what, is what Jesus is saying. And so here's, here's where he comes to the real point, friends. Listen carefully. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Did you hear that? Of all the things that God wants us to ask, that Jesus teaches us to ask with the promise that it will be given, he says, how much more will the Heavenly, Heavenly, Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Here's the question, friends. Do you want to make a difference in the world? Do you want to have power to make a difference in the world? If the answer is yes, then open yourself up to the Holy Spirit in prayer. Be careful what you ask for. But remember, to receive the Holy Spirit, to experience the life-changing power of God, all you have to do is ask. Let us pray. Eternal God, we are thankful for the opportunity to pray. 
We are thankful that we can have this relationship with you where we open our hearts and minds to your presence in our lives, that we can ask for all that we need, and that we can trust the promise that of all the gifts you give us, you promise to give us your spirit and your power so that we can live the lives that you desire we live, that we can serve you the way you desire we serve, that we can be instruments of your transformation for the world that desperately needs it. And so I ask at this hour that you fill us with your spirit, that you open our hearts and minds to receive what you offer, that you empower us to be your people. We are confident when we pray, we are confident that you will keep your promises. And so we lift up to you our needs for today, our, our needs for healing when we are sick and hurting, our needs for comfort when we are grieving, our needs for strength when we are weak, our needs for understanding when we, when we can't comprehend what's happening in our lives and the world around us, our need for peace in the middle of brokenness. We pray not only on behalf of ourselves and our families, but we pray for our church and our community and our nation and our world. And we pray that you will fill us and your church with your spirit so that we can be, be present to those who need us and that you can be present through us. We pray that we might be willing to receive what you offer and share what we have received with others. We know it's scary, and we understand that, that when your spirit fills us, we, you might send us to places we're not, we're not eager to go. And yet, we know, we know deep down that you know best. And I ask you now to give us the courage we need to trust you. To trust you with our lives. To trust you with our children and our families. To trust you with, with our community, our nation, and our world. And trust you with the church, your church which you have called into being to, to transform your world. And so I pray, gracious God, that you will teach us to pray. That you will teach us to pray once again so that your spirit might be at work and that your world will be transformed in ways that are beyond our comprehension. So we, as we have asked to learn to pray, we know that you would have us pray this way. And so we join together praying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, in response to the good news of the gospel, the promise that God is with us, the promise of God's spirit in our lives, the power of God to work in us, uh, we respond by continuing to pray, by opening ourselves up to what God is doing, by observing a holy Lent, uh, which includes praying and studying and serving and fasting or giving up something so that we can make room for God to work in our lives. It also includes, as Jesus teaches us, giving to others. And so as we observe a Holy Lent, I want to invite you to give generously to what God is doing in the world through the ministries of Trinity Church. You know that uh, God is doing great things. Uh, you see them in our worship. Uh, kids are learning and growing. Uh, our kids are, are reading scripture for us during this season, and, and our confirmation class members are learning and growing. Uh, our building is open to... Uh, some activities and many, many online activities. And I just want to remind you that even in the midst of COVID-19, the church is still the church. And so uh, your gifts are making possible the ministries that God desires. So I want to encourage you to give generously. Uh, you can uh, use your uh, phone and download the Trinity app and use that. It's simple and easy. That's uh, how I am giving these days. You can write a check and uh, make sure it gets to the church. You can go to our website as well and uh, arrange uh, to give that way. And so I just want to thank you for your generosity and, and promise you that Trinity, that God is blessing and multiplying your tithes and offerings and that through Trinity Church, lives are being transformed. We may not be able to see it because we're still socially distanced, but I believe with the, 
the fullness of all that I can believe, that God is doing great things, that God is empowering this church to change the world, and you're part of that. And I want to thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Let us receive our tithes and offerings. Gilmer, one of the pastors here. You've already met Neil Huff and Keith Lee, our other pastors here at Trinity. We are so glad you're in worship with us this day. A couple of things to tell you about, and I invite you to, again, look at that bulletin that you can find the link to in the description of this video. You'll see that we're going to have a fellowship time today at 1130. We hope that you will join us on Zoom. All the information you need is right there in the bulletin. You'll find a way to uh, reach out to us and get to see us and everybody else that's participating in today's Zoom fellowship time. So please plan on joining us today again at 1130. Look in the bulletin for all the information. You'll also see information in there about a new study that is happening starting this week on Tuesday morning and Wednesday evenings. We hope you'll join Pastor Ann as she has a Bible study on the gospel according to Luke and how we get to see the way that Jesus prays. Teach us to pray is the name of this study. Again, it's Tuesday morning and Wednesday evenings. Pastor Ann will be looking at the ways that Jesus prayed and the times in his life that he prayed and how we can apply that to our lives today. And in this season of Lent, it is such an important thing. We hope you'll join us for that. One last thing I hope you'll look for in the bulletin is information on our preschool expansion. We'll be adding kindergarten in the fall and extended day for our preschoolers. So please look for that and pass that information along to your family and friends. Again, we're glad you're here in worship with us this day. Welcome. Our hymn can be found in your e-bulletin, Holy Spirit, Truth, Divine. We will sing all verses. Will you join us? Thank you for joining us for our worship service today. As I, I said earlier, I want to thank all of those who make this possible. Uh, Keith Lee and Eileen Gilmer, Jerry Rich and Catherine Wethington, our, our musical ensemble, Jason Stevens for reading the scripture today, and all of you for participating wherever you are and for your faithfulness uh, to the ministries of God's church here at Trinity uh, Church in McLean. And I just want to thank you for being willing to consider that God can change our lives when we are willing to pray that God's spirit will fill us and guide us and God's power 
will direct us to where God wants us to be. And that is a scary promise, but a wonderful promise as well. And so thank you for being a part of our worship today. A benediction, uh, you'll find it in the bulletin, or, or simply just hear these words of blessing. We have received the Spirit and are blessed by God. So believe the gospel and proclaim the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, all God's people say, Amen. Jesus and his disciples had a busy day. The whole day, Jesus taught people about God. When evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across the other side. They sailed across the lake. Then all of a sudden, a great windstorm arose and the wave beat into the boat. The boat was in trouble. The disciples were worried. They tried their best to steer the boat to safety, but to no avail. One disciple shouted, Let's ask Jesus to help us. Another asked, where is he? They found him in the stern, asleep on a cushion. They woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind stopped and there was peaceful calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? <laughs> 